everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Today, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Ilan Kelman, Professor of Disasters and Health at University College London. At UCL, Professor Kelman is part of the Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction, where his research often focuses on linking disasters and health, including exploring the integration of climate change into both disaster and health research. <clears throat> he has authored several books on the topic of disasters and their impacts on our lives. And today he will be discussing his latest work, Disaster by Choice, How Our Actions Turn Natural Hazards into Catastrophes. His book examines the ways in which human choices exacerbate, and in some cases, even cause the disaster part of so-called natural disasters. It's a topic that is certainly timely given everything going on in the world today. So on behalf of Toxic Google and everyone watching, Dr. Kelman, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for the opportunity and thank you to everyone for joining us. So it is, yeah, rather interesting times and it sort of makes us question, well, we've talked about disasters for so long and we research disasters, try and influence policy, try and get even businesses to deal with business continuity and think about different scenarios. And suddenly it's like, well, if I'm going to stand here and, tell, and ask you to tell me, well, what is a disaster? We're living it. And in a sense, sort of what I've gone through is nothing compared to the vast majority of the population of the world. So yeah, it has been a bit of inconvenience that has turned things upside down, but I still have the opportunity to be online. I still have my technology, I still have my internet. Um, unlike many other people, I certainly still have my job and I'm able to hopefully be doing some good science to help society and to serve people. And it sort of then says, well, in this situation, why are these influences, why are these impacts differentiated? Why am I in such a good position? Why can so many of us continue what we're doing despite this global disaster? And it very sadly reflects everything which is in this book, Disaster by Choice, everything that we've sort of done and all the issues which we've raised and talked about, which happened long before, uh, long before all of the, the pandemic issues hit. So I'm sort of going to go through some of the ideas and also recognize that we do discuss a lot and we do disseminate a lot on social media. So some of my social media links have been flashing up, they're going to be there and please do engage. Because what we're all going to realize is that despite the fact that so much of this pandemic and the influences were known beforehand, so much of what we should have done and didn't do have been in the books and the textbooks and the emergency plans and the policies and the laws for decades, there's obviously still a lot that we don't know. And there may be a lot which to us works in theory, sort of in a book on an online seminar, but it simply doesn't apply to you individually. So that's where we need the feedback. That's where we need the discussion to recognize that we know so much, we have so much on disaster science, but we also have a long way to go, particularly in terms of taking our knowledge, translating it into wisdom, and trying to ensure that those who do have the power, who do have the resources, who do have the choices, are able to do far better in the situation that we have now in this disaster situation. But it still goes back to the basics in terms of what is a disaster? And again, this has been looked at for decades. It is defined in legislation. It is defined in many company policies or academic papers or even books written, which are called, titled, what is a disaster? And I went through all this and I tried to say, well, how simple can I get it? How can I distill all the ideas? And what I came up with was basically seven words. A disaster is a situation requiring outside help for coping. Something happens, we cannot deal with it, so someone has to help us get through the situation. You know, it's fairly simple. I hope it's somewhat intuitive. There's obviously a lot of vagueness in the words. What does coping mean? What does outside help mean? But when we're talking, when we're using language, there's always going to be disagreements and ambiguities. But I think that this idea at least translates across languages and many cultures and really hits down to this baseline idea that whether it's an individual or a country or the world, something goes wrong, we cannot deal with it ourselves. And so we have to bring in other resources, other help, other approaches, simply a situation requiring outside support for coping. Even if this is straightforward, even if we accept it, even if it is fairly intuitive, it then becomes a challenge. Well, hang on a minute. When we know that these things happen, 
when we have 10,000 years of human history to draw on, even the pandemic, we've had so many pandemics before, why does the situation arise that we're not ready for it? Why does the situation arise that we can't deal with it ourselves? And this is where it does end up becoming a bit more complicated because the disaster or the risk of disaster emerges from two very sort of unintuitive, not easily translatable concepts. And those two concepts are hazards and vulnerability. So what is a hazard? Well, fairly straightforward, a virus, an earthquake, what I'm experiencing at the moment in terms of heat, that it's sort of hovering between 30, 35 degrees Celsius, and, and I'm in London, UK, and the infrastructure is simply not built for it. So in, in the context that we're talking about, it's therefore something from the environment, the tornado, the tsunami, the volcanic eruption, which can cause problems if we encounter it, so it becomes hazardous. That's actually the hazard. Some of these happen quickly, like the, like the tsunami, like the volcanic eruption, like the tornado. Some of them are more slowly. So yeah, the virus was there, but it took a while to ramp up till it uh, reached the entire world, certainly droughts. They tend to ramp up quite slowly and then diminish quite slowly. But all this is is something from the environment. It's something that we know. It's something that we've dealt with so many times before. So why does that phenomenon from the environment end up becoming a situation requiring outside support for coping? And that's where the second element, the really insidious aspect of disaster risk comes in. This is what we call vulnerability. The fact that some people can deal and get th deal with and get through an earthquake, and some people cannot. Some people appear to be more susceptible to microorganisms like the coronavirus. Others may have had it and didn't even notice. So we need to consider this element of which really tackles this point of coping in terms of how we as individuals, as collectives of society, can or cannot deal with hazards. And this is a vulnerability, this long-term process, which may be within our bodies, physical, but it's more, much more often societal, a long-term process which sets up people in communities to be in a situation where they experience harm or damage from the just typical environmental event like the storm, like the landslide. This might simply be poorly constructed buildings, poor planning regulations, or just lack of any zoning whatsoever. Perhaps we do not understand warning messages because we don't speak the language or we don't receive it because we don't have the technology like we're using now. It could be that you know everything, you receive everything, but you actually cannot evacuate due to mobility issues and lack of support mechanisms for people with mobility issues. Or simply, you don't want to go outside and evacuate. You don't want to go to the emergency shelter because you know that violent assaults, physical assault, sexual assault happens there, and you'd much rather take your chance with the volcanic eruption or with the cyclone than actually take your chance in that shelter where you know you may be attacked or robbed. So the issue is not really what the environment is doing because we understand that we can deal with it. It's these decisions or lack of decisions in terms of being able to cope with it and actually address some of these situations. And this is fairly easily illustrated, both the good and the bad. So I'll take sort of the example, which, you know, at the moment people seem to have forgotten, and that's the example of earthquakes. And it's kind of forgotten because we're dealing with the pandemic and the US, of course, hurricane season and wildfire season are starting. So people are, are now not thinking about, well, how can I get this long-term process of seismic resistance into the building codes, into the buildings? But earthquakes are fairly straightforward, right? If, you're, if your structure stands up, you're going to be okay. If your structure does not stand up, then you're in a bit of trouble. So we then need to think, how many people actually have their cause of death as being earthquakes? And that construction, that question is very deliberate, cause of death. Because fundamentally, as I alluded to, the earthquake does not cause the death. It's that building falling down. So we sort of say, you know, a bit provocative, but to throw out the idea, zero people are killed by earthquakes. And in fact, many people who deal with community issues in earthquakes, whether they're earthquake engineers, seismologists, or community workers, actually say earthquakes don't kill people, collapsing infrastructure does. And we can take an example. 
So I'll go back to sort of the year 2003. And 26 September 2003, absolutely massive earthquake in northern Japan. We were talking moment magnitude 8.3. It was pretty shallow. I mean, only sort of about 20, 25 kilometers below the surface. And of course, you're going to feel that. But no one died. And just an hour later, there was another massive aftershock. And again, no one died. Except after, when people were cleaning up the glass, one person was hit by a car and killed. So we have an absolutely massive hazard, an earthquake which we know causes destruction, such as Haiti in 2010, and yet in this northern part of Japan, the death toll was one. Fast forward three months, 22nd December 2003, Central California, fairly moderate earthquake. I mean, we're talking moment magnitude 6.5, so you absolutely feel it, but it's not a big issue. And it was very shallow, it was only 10 kilometers deep. And the death toll was two. What happened is that two people in one building felt the shaking, ran outside, which of course, if your building is going to stand up, running outside is not a good idea. You should drop cover and hold. As they ran outside, a tower on the building collapsed, fell on them and killed them. And the property owner was found liable for failing to maintain that property up to seismic resistance standards. So there was a choice. The death toll could have been zero, Instead, we had a fairly moderate earthquake and the death toll was really only two. Four days later, 26 December 2003, southern Iran, Bam Iran, a world heritage city, an earthquake almost identical to what hit California. This was 6.7, so moment magnitude 6.7, depth 8 kilometers, 25,000 people dead. Now, Iran, California, and Japan have long had some of the best earthquake engineers in the world, some of the best seismologists in the world. In Japan and California, they were able to get this into policy and practice to avoid buildings collapsing in earthquakes. In Iran, they weren't able to. So California and Iran, basically the same hazard, very different disaster. In Japan, the hazard was over 100 times more intense than California and Iran, and yet again, no disaster. So this really shows the difference between hazard and vulnerability. This really shows that the disaster is not about what the environment is doing. The disaster is what we is about what we are doing. And this does not change overnight. You know, California didn't work, wake up on 21st December 2003 and say, okay, we need an earthquake building code, let's do something. And then there was an earthquake 24 hours later. No, this goes back decades. And in fact, Los Angeles' first formal seismic building code happened after the 1933 Long Beach earthquake. So this takes a long time, and same with Japan. They did so much, and they learned so much from the 1923 Tokyo Edo earthquake, which ended up killing over 100,000 people, to the point that in 2003, they were fine. And same with 2011, of course. I mean, that was absolutely huge. That was in the top five earthquakes that we've ever recorded. And the high rises, the skyscrapers were shaped, were swaying back and forth in Tokyo, which was exactly what they were designed to do. Because if they don't sway back and forth, then they're going to collapse, killing thousands. The fact that they're engineered to deal with the shaking meant that they didn't collapse and people did not die. And that huge earthquake on 11th March 2011 was a testament to the earthquake engineering and the policy of Japan, a massive success story, except for the tsunami, which killed over 15,000 people. Even though Japan has ingrained in their culture a millennium of dealing with tsunamis. Again, this illustrates, they dealt with the earthquake, the hazard. They did not deal with the tsunami, the hazard. So the earthquake was not a disaster, the tsunami was. Again, the disaster is when we do something to create and maintain vulnerability. So we end up with a situation requiring outside coping, requiring outside help for coping. And it's not necessarily about what the environment does, it's very much about what we do. And we can apply this approach of hazard and vulnerability to the current situation, to the pandemic as well. So if you think about, for example, well, what is a hazard? The hazard is a virus. 
And yet viruses are natural. You know, it's not great that they jump species and they jump species because we are encroaching into ecosystems. They jump species because we deal with animals without proper hygiene, whether it's cleaning them, sorry, whether it's eating them um, or trying to clean them or, or being in close proximity as with uh, swine flu. Um, simply by this, by not respecting the environment, by not respecting animals, we actually create the conditions where these viruses can jump to us and cause problems. And we saw that with HIV, we saw that with Ebola, we saw that with swine flu, with H1N1, and of course with the previous coronaviruses, SARS in 2002 to 2004 and MERS in 2012, those all came from our simply inappropriate dealings with animals and with the environment. But we're not going to eliminate all microbes, and of course we need some. So we have to understand that like the earthquake, the hazard exists, and that's fine. We can deal with the earthquake. We saw that in Japan and California. We saw what happens in Iran when we just, and Haiti when we decide not to deal with it. So same with the virus. Some of them, some of the microorganisms we do eliminate, like smallpox, like rinderpest, like the very solid efforts to almost get rid of polio. And we're actually doing quite well. Other times it may not be possible to get rid of it, but we can certainly accept the fact that the viruses or the microorganisms may jump to species, may jump to us from other species. So number one, we want to reduce that chance by not going wantonly into ecosystems and destroying them. And number two, dealing with animals appropriately. But number three, we have to accept that times the earthquake is going to happen. At times there's going to be uh, a, a, a microorganism jumping species into us. So how can we deal with the hazard? Well, we can watch for it. Surveillance, monitoring, being aware that when a health professional says, um, I think we have a bit of a cluster here, which is a really bizarre form of pneumonia. Maybe you should take a look at it actually believing them and dealing with it. Instead, when the health professionals identified this hazard, this possible new sickness in Wuhan, China, the response of those with power and choices was to intimidate the doctors, to silence them, to say, oh, we have it under control. To say, oh, you know what? Human to human transmission is not possible. Until again, it was too late. So irrespective of the virus, irrespective of the jumping species, even when a new disease emerges, we can and should deal with it as long as we've resourced the mechanisms which we need, as long as we've dealt with it properly, and as long as we are willing to say, you know what, maybe there has to be a local lockdown for a week till we figure this out. Maybe we do need to have much more support for medical research so that we're not waiting a year, two years for a vaccine. So we have the labs up and running and we have the expertise ready to go as opposed to certainly in the UK and many other countries, for more than a decade, a lot of science budgets have been cut. So the issue is partly the virus, but the issue is also when a strange new disease emerges, are we going to deal with it appropriately? And that's very much on the hazard side where we made the decision that we are going to cut the budget for international surveillance and monitoring. Authorities in Wuhan made the decision that they were not going to believe the health professionals and then when we got into the situation where it was clear the virus was spreading around the world, certainly the UK was very reluctant to implement lockdown and did so far too late. And of course, there's many other countries like Brazil and the US, which are simply trying to avoid any form of, of implementing sort of virus control, transmission control. Of course, there are the costs to lockdown. And this sort of gets into the vulnerability side. Number one, what about health systems? Why do we have a situation where some countries were desperate to get into lockdown because they knew their health systems could not cope with people infected by the virus? The UK illustrates this starkly. Every winter, flu comes. I mean, this isn't a big deal, but we know this is happening. But yet every winter, many hospitals have to declare a major incident and cancel non-essential surgery in order to deal with the influx of flu patients. This is normal. I mean, this isn't an emergency. This is like every year winter hits, we're going to have a, a flu disaster, therefore they have the plans in place. This is a state to which we have degraded our health system. So we cannot even deal with what we know, never mind these sudden aspects of what we don't know like coronavirus.
And then there are other countries like the US where there's a very clear ideology that healthcare should not be universal, healthcare should not be accessible, and so a lot of people are going to die. And yet yeah, that's ideological. And if people want to choose that ideology, of course, that, that's how we can vote, that's what we can do. But then we have to accept that yes, we are killing people. And when we get something slightly unusual like COVID-19, it's going to be even worse. So we set up our vulnerabilities, we've created our vulnerabilities so that our health systems cannot even cope with typical issues like flu or typical issues like ensuring that everyone who needs healthcare can get it, which means of course they're going to collapse under something different like coronavirus. I mean, there's just no option, which meant that governments across Europe, in the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and many others said, well, we have to go to lockdown. And lockdown itself, expose the chronic long-term vulnerabilities which are ever present and which as a society we don't seem willing or able to deal with so that people have to have this outside help for coping it becomes a disaster i mean what does lockdown do well it exacerbates mental health it exacerbates domestic violence so absolutely attempted and completed suicides have gone up stress has gone up substance abuse, so excuse me, substance use has gone up. And we also are in the situation where again, people are devastated because they spent their lifetime trying to build up a small business, which has now collapsed. Or the number of deaths from people who were refused the doctor's appointment for potential cancer, and all the people who had cancer, whose treatment was stopped because we were in lockdown. How can we not have a pandemic plan which separates the health system into half, half dealing with the pandemic and half dealing with regular medical issues which continue to kill people. This is just poor planning, poor preparedness. This is creating the vulnerabilities. And fundamentally, if our decision is killing people with the virus or killing people with lockdown, we've lost the battle already. We've come so far in creating that vulnerability where our only choice is to devastate society with a, vi our vi a virus or devastate, devastate society with lockdown. So this pandemic is very much disaster by choice. It is very much pandemic by choice. And the hazard vulnerability approach matches it too. And it's even the same with climate change. So, you know, there's really no scientific doubt. We are changing the climate. It is leading to an overall increase in the average air temperature with all sorts of knock-on effects. But you know what? Air temperature is just the environment. It's just weather. It's actually just the hazard. Yeah, warmer air holds more moisture. More, more, more moisture means that when it rains, it, may, it rains much more intensely. You get more rain in general, you get more flooding, although there are other factors in there like soil saturation and runoff and so forth. But in general, the fact that we are causing climate change will lead in, in most areas to more intense flooding. That's just flooding. That's just a hazard. If we want to deal with flooding, we can do, do it in exactly the same way that if we want to deal with earthquakes, we can do it. So, But the problem is that we can't deal with flooding or we don't want to. So it could be that we are poor. So we have to live in the floodplain. It could be that money went to the military rather than to a bridge across the river, which means that when the river floods, the kids can't get to school. You know, we can say that uh, my neighbor went down to the town council and called out the corruption by saying, you're building in the floodplain and you're taking kickbacks. And then that evening they were shot. Yes, we are changing the climate. Yes, we are doing so rapidly. Yes, it is changing the hazard regimes. But that is only hazard. The disaster comes from vulnerability. The disaster comes from corruption, from kickbacks, from poor development, from not being interested in letting kids get to school during the flood, from even building properties in places which you know will flood without taking flood resistance measures. Or again, going back, people who will not evacuate, despite knowing that they have to evacuate in the storm, because they're too scared to be out on the streets at night, or they're too scared to be in the emergency shelter, they say know exactly what's going to happen to them. So 
irrespective of climate change. That's the hazard. Climate change does not, cannot cause disasters, which means if we want to stop disasters emerging because of climate change, then we have to deal with vulnerabilities and accept and admit the root causes. Except there's always exceptions. So as I sort of alluded to earlier, it is hot in London. I mean, simply by talking here and trying to sort of convey some sort of energy during the talk, I'm absolutely sweating, even though my balcony door is wide open. We will get to the point under climate change where the heat humidity combinations are non-survivable. It will go over the point where you can be outdoors doing outdoor labor and live. If it does not cool down at night, which again is where we're heading, then people are simply going to die because their bodies overheat and there is no recourse. Well, there is a recourse, right? Put in air conditioning. But who can afford that? And it takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of electricity, which means we're just contributing to climate change even more. So it becomes this vicious cycle. Fans are also very energy intensive, but it is going to get to the point where if you put a fan on yourself during a heat wave, you're going to kill yourself because the fan ends up just blowing hot, humid air on you, which means you become more dehydrated and you don't cool down. This is where climate change is pushing us. And this means that heat waves, which before were typical disasters, they were caused by vulnerability, not hazard. Heat waves are going to become highly lethal disasters, the fundamental cause of which is climate change. And then we have to think about the knock-on effects. I sort of said, well, if you're outdoors, you're dead, which means that you can't do outdoor agricultural labor. So what happens to people relying on subsistence? What happens to our food supply? As evaporation and transpiration increases, what happens to our water supply? Most of us here, well, we can just pop down to the local store and pick up some bottled water. But if you rely on mainly natural water sources, it doesn't help you that hurricane season or cyclone season makes that, brings a lot more water and it's much more intense. Because in the dry season, you don't have any water. And when it does rain occasionally, then it immediately evaporates. So rainwater capture, yeah, possibly. But again, evapotranspiration. So there is this major exception, and there are a few others, of climate change pushing the world into heat humidity realms where it's simply not survivable and the disaster is obviously coming from that hazard, although that hazard is obviously exacerbated by us. So we can't even really blame the environment for, for it, even though it is a sort of so-called environmental hazard. And as we go through all of these, there are so many hazards to think about, whether, whether it's space weather or meteorites, and almost all of them, we have options to deal with either the hazard or the vulnerability, meaning that the disaster is us. The disaster is not coming from the environment. There are some exceptions, and I'm happy to go into uh, some of those during the chat. So there's about half a dozen major examples of very rare hazards where they will take out the planet, and there's actually not a lot that we can do about them. Some of them may give, give us a couple of centuries of warning. Some of us uh, may not give us any warning whatsoever. So we sort of say that the disaster does come from vulnerability, but there are some exceptions which means that irrespective uh, of what the environment is doing, the disaster is really about our choices. It's about what we're doing, which again leads to that book titled Disaster by Choice. It then means that we simply do not use the phrase natural disaster because the disaster is what we are doing. The disaster is our creation and maintenance of vulnerability. This isn't nature. Nature doesn't tell us to create poverty. Nature doesn't tell us to create inequity. Nature doesn't tell us how we allocate our budgets. Nature doesn't tell us how we treat people. Nature doesn't tell us to be sexist, or racist, or homophobic, or any other discrimination. So natural disaster is a misnomer. We do not use a phrase natural disaster. In the same way that even calling it a disaster event actually tries to say, well, it's confined in space and time, it's an event. But as I mentioned, this vulnerability has to accrue over the long term. We don't build Californian earthquake resistance overnight. We don't build the Japanese ability to withstand earthquakes and not to withstand tsunamis 
overnight. Both of those took a long time. Back to Bam Iran, southern Iran, World Heritage City, which meant it was a thousand years to build those structures, which collapsed into dust on 26 December 2003. This vulnerability, and thus the disaster, is a long-term process. It is not an event. All disasters happen slowly. They are all a social and political process. Some hazards happen quickly, like the earthquake, like the tornado. Some we have days, like the hurricane, the cyclone. Others take longer. But the disaster itself is not natural, is not an event. And the disaster, the vulnerability, never happens quickly, never happens rapidly. So we need to know this, which we do. We need to accept it, which we sometimes do and sometimes don't. We need to bring people on board to recognize how much we can do, like in California and Japan, like in New Zealand, which has done so well with coronavirus. I mean, having some problems now, but look at that reaction. I mean, immediately they get four cases, boom, deal with it. They're now up to 14 cases and they're working out how to deal with it. They were ready. They were prepared. So there is so much which we can and should do, and there are so many good practice examples. And we bring this into our research, and you know, there's also some very good examples in the papers I write, in the blogs I write, and in the book. We also bring it into our education. So we run several master's programs, uh, sort of a master of disasters. And next September, we are starting the UK's first bachelor degree in humanitarianism. So this will be a bachelor of science in global humanitarian studies, to try and train the young uns to get them into university and say, you know what, there's so much that you can do in the private sector, in the nonprofit sector, in government and in academia, to apply the knowledge to create the wisdom and to reduce vulnerability and to stop disasters. So yes, it is disaster by choice. It is the people who have the resources, it is the people with the power, it is the people who have the opportunity, who have to choose and take the pathway to reduce vulnerability and to stop vulnerability. Ultimately, in the end, to ensure that disaster by choice becomes no disaster by choice. So thank you very much. I'll hand it back over to Matt and looking forward to the questions and discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elon. Uh, we have some time for questions. So for those watching, please add your questions through the YouTube chat window. Uh, to start us off, uh, to what degree can and should technological innovation replace or make up for lower disaster preparedness? Um, in your book, you discuss how building techniques are far more sophisticated today than they were, say, 100 years ago, uh, which can help cities survive earthquakes. Um, how do you think that government officials and researchers should think about the trade-off between innovating on technolo technology versus preparing populations for disasters? For me, there is no trade-off. <clears throat> Both have to be done simultaneously. Both are important and both work. <clears throat> what we do know is there is no single solution for every location. There is no single solution for every vulnerability. So we have to sit down, work together, and say this is actually very much about joining forces and saying we need the engineers, we need the architects, we need the planners, we need the design professionals, we need the computer scientists, we need the computer technologists, we need those working with remote sensing, building satellites, looking at telemetry, doing it real time, sitting in the same room as a behavioral scientist, as a sociologist, as a political scientist, as an anthropologist. Look, we're one species on one planet, not doing a great job of it. So let's really make it truly that we're all in this together rather than the separation. We cannot do it without technology. We cannot do it without these innovative processes and the big data and the real-time analysis and all the wonderful information which we're creating, whether it's algorithms, whether it's data, whether it's information, whether it's software and communications, but nor can we rely on it. These things go wrong. Technology and behavioral interventions can each have uh, consequences that are, that are that may be surprising, even if they shouldn't be. So it's about saying, what repertoire do we have? Let's ensure technology is on the table. Let's ensure that behavioral innovation and social and political approaches are on the table. But let's not assume that they contradict each other. Let's not assume there's a trade-off. 
let's not assume that anyone always works. Let's see what we have, look at the context, and go forth together to use everything we have to save lives. That makes sense. Uh, another question. Throughout your book, you discuss the numerous inequalities that exist in the world and how they impact the vulnerability of different populations. Uh, you also touch on how disaster modeling, particularly modeling the paths of hurricanes, is one tool that we use to provide early warnings to cities and states. Um, I'm curious if there are any known inequities in these models in terms of the regions that receive attention for modeling, but also in the generation of the models themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Certainly. So we're looking at these sort of cyclonic storms and the general phrase is tropical cyclones, which covers hurricanes, cyclones and typhoons. So hurricane cyclones and typhoons are all the same. They're just depends where they originate and where they go. They're all tropical cyclones. And there's no doubt that the ones which tend to hit the richer countries have far more sophisticated models than in many other places. So even when we look at uh, the projected impacts of climate change on these storms, overall, it is fairly clear that climate change is going to increase intensity. So they will be far more powerful and drop a lot more rain, but decrease frequency. So we will have fewer storms, but worse. What we do know is that we have about 15 years, if not more, of incredibly robust and consistent research for Atlantic hurricanes. There's only about half a dozen papers looking at Bay of Bengal cyclones. So that very much illustrates the inequities in the research, what the models are telling us and, and where, where the money goes in terms of trying to say, what will climate change do to these storms? There's also an inequity of communication. So the what certainly if we're talking about the US and hurricanes, what NOAA does with their probability cones and their forecast, it's world leading. I mean, it really is fantastic and phenomenal. They certainly need a lot more support. There is a long way to go, including communication, but they have taught people in the world just trying to do better understanding what goes right and what goes wrong. So the information is out there and it's really, really easy to access and pretty straightforward to understand. If you have a computer or a phone and internet access, if you speak English, if you are not colorblind, if you have accessibility in terms of being able to uh, reach the, the information in the media which is provided, and if you actually have the time and scope to sit down and say, okay, here's a strike probability, here's where it might go, therefore, do I have a relative, should I book a hotel, should I load up my car and be ready to go? Because if you don't have cash for a hotel, if you don't have relatives, if you don't have a car, doesn't matter how much knowledge you have, evacuation is incredibly difficult. So yeah, these inequities start at the level of funding, funding the basic research and promoting it and go straight through to who can make the decision, how can they make the decision, uh, and what happens when they do make the decision to evacuate or not. That makes sense, thank you. Um, we can start now with some audience questions. Uh, so we have one from Katie who asks, uh, this is a fascinating talk. Thank you. Beyond your book, are there any other uh, books, articles, podcasts, etc., that you recommend if you were checking out to learn more? Yeah, I mean, there's so much out there. One very good podcast is called Disasters Deconstructed. And that, as it says, sort of deconstructs ideas of, of disasters. Another podcast um, which comes out of my university, University College London, is called Anti Waffle. So if you search for anti-waffle podcasts, they go across science and try and get a uh, scientist like me to stop the waffle and just describe the science in, in real English. And a lot of those pertain to disasters. In terms of uh, books uh, and papers, a lot will depend on your interest. So there are quite a lot of popular science books out there, sort of like mine, um, which deal specifically with uh, an earthquake or a hurricane like Hurricane Katrina. Um, or specific terrorist attacks like 9-11. There are other ones which are a bit more general and are looking at specific countries or specific issues. But I'd also encourage people, you know, so much of the original scientific papers are free. So try them. Just try and do a scientific literature search uh, or go to the disaster journals, see what makes sense and what doesn't, download them, and let us know whether or not you understand them. So some of the names of journals, um, some of which are free, some of which are not, are the International Journal of Disaster Risk Science, the International Journal of Disaster Risk Reduction, Progress in Disaster Studies, 
Disaster Prevention and Management, JAMBA, the Journal of African Disaster Studies, and then the journal with the title Disasters. So, you know, they're online. Many, not all of the articles are free. See what works for you and what doesn't. Um, feel free to email me. I can absolutely send a list of websites, of podcasts, of books, and of papers. And what I need is feedback from you. And we can do this via Twitter, Instagram also, exchanging that way. Um, just let me know. You know, I'll recommend something. And you can say, you know, I didn't understand it. Didn't make sense. Or a disastrous deconstructed podcast will direct you to someone else or something else. And you can say, there's a great resource. Please, please uh, sort of support this and promote it. Um, there's also a YouTube series coming out of a UK secondary school a geog geography teacher called The Curious Geographer. And so I have one session there, and there's a number of other scientists dealing with disaster issues who are on the YouTube series, The Curious Geographer. And finally, my Disasters Institute at UCL, the Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction, we have a YouTube channel where each of the staff members is going on and just giving a lecture, which is meant to be uh, for the public in terms of different aspects of emergencies and disasters. So if you check out UCL IRDR on YouTube, you will not only see those, but also work out the other events which we run throughout the year, which again are meant to convey these ideas to the people. So yeah, link with me on social media or drop me an email, let me know what works or doesn't work. And this is how I learn to try and do better and how we can bring up these sources. Finally, there is currently a Twitter thread, which is about disaster books as Taylor Swift photographs. So they've tried to match up book covers with what Taylor Swift looks like in, in a photo. And this is a good way to pick up possible disaster books. That's excellent, thank you so much. Um, the next question is from Helena. She asks, is there a way for humanity to change our ways to respect the environment and not create these disasters by choice? It's up to us. That's what we have to do. We have many problems we can identify, many troubles and many examples where things didn't work, but we also have so many examples where things did work. So if we look at, for example, two cities, Boulder, Colorado and Toronto, Ontario, both those cities have decided that they really want to try and eliminate flash flood deaths. So they bought out properties in the floodplain. After there were flash floods, which knocked out houses, they deliberately did not rebuild. And they've tried to turn these flash floodplains as much as possible into recreational areas and natural areas. In Toronto, this happened after Hurricane Hazel killed 83 people in 1954. In Boulder, Colorado, it was really based on, I think that flash flood was 1919, if I remember correctly. And they've been working for several decades. So it's interesting, you go to Boulder and you go to Toronto and you think, wow, these are really nice green areas, you know, people having great fun cycling down these paths, which extend for kilometers through the cities. And it's wonderful to have the river there and great to have a picnic. Um, and even in Toronto, there's actually quite extensive wildlife. So you can be walking along and see deer uh, or coyotes uh, amongst many others. And people say, this is the green living. This is how you have quality of life in the city. And Toronto actually calls itself a city within a park. But what is generally forgotten in both Boulder and Toronto is that it came out of disasters. And the idea was not so much a recreational greenway. The idea was let the floodplain be a floodplain, not a hospital, not an old age people's care home, not a school, but a floodplain. So when the water comes, we get a flood, but we do not get a flood disaster. So these are two wonderful examples of exactly what you're asking, living with the environment to avoid disasters. But of course, there are many other places where it's not working. So let's learn from the successes. Let's also learn from other cultures. There are many traditional and non-traditional approaches around the world where people have said, let's live with the heat, let's live with the cold, let's live with the slope, let's use a volcano to be a resource rather than a threat. So there are places where people actually want lava to come out occasionally because it burns the vegetation, which means that grass grows and they use the grass for their cattle, which is their livelihoods. Of course, you have to have the monitoring and evacuation. So if there's too much lava, they can get away and don't get killed. 
but it's a way of saying the environment exists. It provides a resource. Let's ourselves stop it being a threat. I think in line with that, Randall has a question that goes back to your discussion on the definition of a disaster. He says, climate change feels like a disaster in waiting, but what outside help can we appeal to? Yeah, and, and that very much comes back to the fact that climate, is, climate change is altering hazards, but it's up to us for vulnerability. And the definition which I propose, those seven words, does have limitations. And one limitation is exactly what you're alluding to. Well, what if the hazard is global? And in a sense, the pandemic is like that because there is no outside authority to appeal to. What it means is actually recognizing that some people are still doing fine and some people are not. So yeah, you know how, ma how many people have made money out of this pandemic? You know, there are plenty. There are plenty who are able to just shut themselves up in their mansion with their private gym and their fast internet and not worry about it. So this is where they have effectively made themselves outside the system. <clears throat> so let's join with them and appeal to them to try and support. With climate change, yeah, it is certainly boundary because when we get to that point where the heat and humidity uh, exceeds our ability to survive, then yes, climate change becomes a disaster. It's a hazard and non-survivable. So there is, as you say, there is really no kind of outside authority but those who have tried to be outside the system are very much those who have the opportunity and the resources to change. And that's where we really have to bring them on board to ensure that the fossil fuel companies, for example, which receive more subsidies every year from governments than governments spend on weapons, and we know how much they spend on weapons. So by taking those subsidies, they are effectively creating the problem and they're being outside the system by not being willing to do anything about it to move towards more environmentally, environmentally friendly approaches, they are effectively putting them outside the system and that's what we need to bring on board. Now I appreciate, I mean, this is really just wordplay. It's sort of wordsmithing trying to make the definition work, but it's also saying that even when it is global, there are different groups and there are people who fit into different groups. I'd say, look, any words have limitations my definition actually has some very major limitations, one of which you've identified. So let's not just get hung up on that. Let's just say, well, what do we have to do? Who do we have to bring on board and go forward that way? And as we're hopefully getting some thunderstorms now, I'm just going to turn on the light so you can see me a bit better. Thank there you. Uh, so Greg has a question that builds on that a little bit. He said, uh, many of the hazards facing humanity are global in scale. Example, pandemics, economic inequity, climate change. What can we as individuals do to break the cycle of vulnerability? Yeah, and again, if it's hazard, <clears throat> the global hazard in itself may not necessarily be a problem. Some absolutely are. And again, there are hazards which hit the planet quickly, which we cannot deal with and could potentially wipe us out. Climate change is not one of them. The pandemic is not one of them. But there are hazards which fall into that category. Otherwise, it's just a hazard. So let's deal with the vulnerability. When it's inequity, that is vulnerability. When it is an economic system, which gives us a choice of pandemic or lockdown, neither of which is viable for, for most people, that is a vulnerability. So this is where these vulnerabilities are global, they are baseline, and they are caused by the structural aspects of the system. And this is what we have to change. If we did not have economic inequity, and if we did not have an economic system which was premised on people spending as much money as quickly as possible, we would not have had the choice of pandemic or lockdown. If we did not have this system premised on people consuming as much as possible, we would not have climate change or human-caused climate change. So this is very much sort of coming out from your, from your question the point of really focusing on the vulnerabilities and not worrying about that environmental hazard, apart from a few of the exceptions, which yes, are potentially threats to humanity. Thank you. Next, we have Grace who's asking, Harry Shearer worked to change the dialogue about the New Orleans floods from natural disaster to man-made event, including his movie, The Big Uneasy. 
What are your thoughts on coastal cities? Yeah, in the same way, absolutely, that natural disaster is a misnomer. We also try and avoid sort of man-made as being not gender neutral. Appreciate that the current structure of society means that, yes, most of the problems are man-made. But we also have to recognize that we have to involve everyone together. And if we look back to some of our female leaders like, you know, Margaret Thatcher um, and many of the others, they are absolutely as complicit in the problems we see today as the men. So, yeah, it's really about human caused, human made, and bringing everyone together rather than trying to differentiate. So, thoughts about coastal cities. Well, if we deal with the vulnerability, what's the issue? New Orleans is interesting because it was built below sea, or parts of it are built below sea level in the hurricane belt. So, of course, it's going to flood. And it has a long history of flooding. Katrina should not have been a surprise particularly given that the hurricane itself was not that terrible. It went across Florida at category five, caused very little damage in Florida, partly because it didn't go across large populated areas. If it had hit Miami, well, that would have been huge, but partly because Floridians have also experienced a lot of hurricanes and are somewhat better equipped to deal with it than other places. Again, a Category 5 into Miami, we're in trouble. Um, other places are, are a lot better. Then it went over the Gulf and it lost strength. So by the time it made landfall, it was really borderline between Category 3 and 4. It's like, come on, Category 3, Cat 4, we should be able to deal with that. The whole issue was the vulnerability, not the hazard. It was a fact that extraction of groundwater and fossil fuels had caused subsidence. It was a fact that ecosystem devastation in front of New Orleans had taken out the wetlands, which made the storm surge worse. It was a fact that they did rely on structural defenses, which had not been properly maintained or repaired. So people looked and said, oh yeah, there's a wall there, we're fine. But then the wall started leaking and there were different failures because of that. But more fundamentally, it was the inherent ingrained long-term inequities, discrimination and racism which meant people did not have choices. It was the voting patterns. People not only elected a mayor of New Orleans who is now in prison for corruption and felonies, they elected a president who appointed to head the Federal Emergency Management Agency, someone who effectively had zero experience in the topic. So the issue is not being on the coast. The issue is not being in a city. The issue is if you're going to build a city on the coast, you better deal with the vulnerabilities over the long term, unless, of course, you want a disaster. Thank you. So we have time for one last question. And Adam asks, love the logic of vulnerabilities versus disasters. What other parallels can you make with this strategy of accountability? Do you feel this is counter to typical human reaction? It is a hard message to get across in many circumstances because it means that we are taking the blame. The good thing with natural disaster is its nature. While well, it's an act of a deity, well, there's nothing that we can really do because this is what the environment does. By turning it around and talking about these long-term processes of discrimination, oppression, inequity, and justice, we have to change by telling people that you voted for a president who when he was told that a plane hit one of the towers, he just sat there and did nothing, means that we are culpable. The fact that in the UK, in December in the election, we had a very clear choice for prime minister and we gave a huge majority to someone who goes into a hospital with coronavirus patients, shakes their hand and then jokes about it. We are culpable for electing these people. We are culpable for creating the systems of media which influence people and which give misinformation and disinformation. So by putting it towards vulnerability, it can be very hard to say, yes, we are responsible and we have to change. But this is that message of disaster by choice. Now, of course, whose choice? Because I don't own media. I can't tackle the misinformation and disinformation. I cannot really put out my own and influence people. So how culp culpable am I? 
we all have some level of choice, we all have some level of resources. It's about doing what we can to use that while recognizing that, yeah, there's always people who have more resources, more options, more opportunities than me, who are more powerful, but there's also people who have a lot less. And so hopefully I can have a positive influence on those who don't have as much as I do, while recognizing I cannot do everything, not every individual can do everything. So again, it's about joining forces and working together. And analogies, well, it goes beyond the disasters. It goes beyond those specific situations. It's about everyday risks. It's about who smokes. It's about who decides to wear a seatbelt. It's about who lives in areas with higher air pollution and higher water pollution. So people, particularly in the US, but this has now come to the UK and many other places around the world, what's called environmental justice. Recognizing that it tends to be the poorest people and the most people discriminated against who tend to be exposed to the most pollution of all types, who tend to be exposed to the most violence of all types. And the violence is not just shootings and stabbings, but it's also about the everyday quiet or silent violence, whether it's words, whether it's not being called for an interview because of your name, whether it's walking down the street and being attacked, because someone thinks that you maybe look sort of Chinese, and of course all Chinese are responsible for coronavirus. Or again, after 9-11, where one Sikh man was murdered, was shot at a gas station in Texas, because of course Sikhs are like Muslims, apparently. And of course all Muslims or anyone who might look like a Muslim is responsible for 9-11. That is the inherent silence, silent continual violence, the everyday risk. And there's a hashtag everyday sexism, there's a hashtag everyday racism. This concept of vulnerability, this concept of our choices, this concept of not willing to take responsibility obviously applies to these minute by minute, day by day, week by week, week, by week issues, which we all experience and which kill people, in fact, tend to kill people far more than a lot of what I've been talking about, the earthquakes, the hurricanes, even the pandemics. So that's where we all have choices to deal with everyday sexism, everyday racism, environmental justice as much as we can, to talk to people about it, to stand up for the issues we believe in, and to move forward again, to ensure that any risks, excuse me, excuse me, are very much risk by choice, and also ensuring that it is a lot less risk by choice. So we are all working together to help each other do so much better for our society and therefore for ourselves. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank you again, Professor Kelman, for joining us today and for providing such great and timely insights in your talk. Uh, no, thank you very much. And again, please contact me on social media, drop me an email, happy to be in touch, seeing what I'm doing wrong and how we can work together to do what is right. Thank you. And for everyone watching, we look forward to seeing you at our next Toxic Google event. Take care, everybody.